Our next guest warning that China is currently experiencing a banking system collapse and that investors should pay close attention to trillions of dollars in real estate losses. Heyman Capital's Kyle Bass joins us this morning. Uh, good morning to you. The implications of this in your mind are what? Geopolitically, economically, just, just play, walk through the dominoes here. Sure. Well, I'm gl glad to be here, Andrew. I think it's important to understand the architecture of their system and what drove the great Chinese miracle on the economic side. It was it was uh, uh, unfettered uh, growth and even speculation in the real estate markets. They've got upwards of 100 million uh, apartments or condos that are vacant today in China. And, and, and again, the, the architecture of their banking system is really important to understand. They've got Roughly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use dollars, but uh, it's really an RMB. They've got about $57 trillion in banking assets. They've got about, uh, uh, you know, $2 trillion in banking equity. Uh, and then they've got their local government financing vehicle market, which financed all their real estate in local markets, is a $13 trillion market where 90% of the market's in default. So when you just think through all those numbers, Andrew, that dwarfs what U.S. banking system lost in the global financial crisis. We lost about $800 billion. Uh, we think that the real estate losses are $4 trillion at least, and we think that the local government financing vehicle market, we don't even know where the bottom to that market is. So to, to, to have a properly functioning capital market, you have to understand the banking system, and their banking system is in free fall right now. Okay, so uh, uh, let's stipulate, and assuming you are correct, there, there's sort of two larger questions. One is obviously what are the what are the issues for multinational companies doing business in China? What's going to happen to their earnings and all of that? And we could talk about that. There's also yeah. the geopolitical question and maybe the political question about what this does to the power or lack of power uh, to President Xi Jinping. And I asked that question because I spoke just last week or it was a week and a half ago now uh, with the president of Taiwan, who actually said because of the economic challenges that she sees uh, China facing, she doesn't believe, for example, uh, that China would go forth uh, with an invasion, for example, of Taiwan. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I also know the president of Taiwan. And, you know, I think publicly she has to say things like that. But I think if, if you're thinking this through this logically, um, if, if Xi Jinping is backed into a corner uh, and he's got youth unemployment somewhere between 20 and 40 percent, uh, he's got disillusioned youth. He's got a real estate market that's collapsed. He has wealth management products that aren't paying. Um, his regime is in real risk if he doesn't refocus uh, the national narrative. And, and my view on that is uh, a move on Taiwan would refocus the national narrative uh, more than uh, backpedaling in financial markets. So uh, while I understand uh, her desire to not be invaded, and, and we all hope that doesn't happen, uh, but if you were to look back over the last 50 years, and choose a date and a time in which you thought America was its most vulnerable and had the worst, worst leadership it's had uh, in the last 50 years, I, I think you would choose 2024 as maybe one of, the, one of your uh, strike points. So I, I think all of those factors come together, whether it's financial, political, uh, um, or geopolitical altogether, uh, I think all of, the, all of the arrows unfortunately point to something negative happening in the, in the near term. And what is so? What does that look like? And I, I understand the argument that politically, if you're if you're having these challenges, it, there's a little bit of a let's don't focus on that ball, focus over here for a little bit. And I I, I see that. But also, by the way, if you're having massive economic challenges internally, uh, it also creates a, a genuine complication with with pursuing some of these other uh, objectives for them politically. Yeah, I mean, as you've seen that you've seen them, uh, Xi Jinping and and his uh, comrades move around the world. Uh, trying to begging the Middle East to settle oil and RMB because, as you know, they're, they're, if this were to happen and the U.S. were to actually sanction someone, you know, our sanctions on Russia uh, were were not even a five percent sanction. We we didn't touch their energy business. We left their banks on SWIFT. We let Russians freely travel around the world. I mean, we really didn't do anything to Russia uh, to inhibit their ability to operate. Um, but I do think if we were to properly sanction China on this maneuver. They need 12 million barrels of crude oil every day. They need eight BCF of LNG every day. They import 40 percent of their food every day, and they have to buy it in dollars. So, Andrew, they've got to figure out how to piece together uh, willing global trading partners that won't adhere to U.S. sanctions. So it's very complicated uh, for them. But again, if you listen to Xi Jinping and forget about the media and whatever you read, 
Just read his speeches since 2017. Right. He tells you what he's going to do. Let, let me ask you a different question. Uh, given the, the number of American businesses that have, have large uh, enterprises in China, dependent on China, do you think, and let's put aside the Taiwan piece for a second, but just straight earnings, straight economic growth in that country and what it's going to do to these companies if, in fact, you think it's as bad as it is? Is that built into the stock prices? And if it isn't, are you shorting them? What are you doing? Yeah, no, I'm, I, we haven't been shorting anything in China since 2016 so that I could give you a, what would what would deem to be a, an unbiased uh, report on what we're seeing over there. Uh, but I think when you look at multinational businesses, I meet with these CEOs behind the scenes, Andrew, and uh, I think it's important to note that many of them are doing all they can to move their supply chains out of China as fast as possible. Some can move quicker than others. They're not going to publicly declare it until it's over. Uh, but I can tell you that the majority of them are moving uh, as, as quickly or as much as they can. And in the end, some are going to get caught uh, with too, too many assets, too many revenues, too much supply chain uh, in China uh, when the music stops. But it's, it's clear where the music's headed. Uh, it's just uh, how long is it going to take uh, something really negative to happen?